Hello everyone. Welcome to the University of Maine Cooperative Extensions Preserving the Maine Harvest webinar. I'm Kathy Savoy and I will be joined today by my colleagues Kate McCarty, Lori Bowen, and a special guest, Rob Dumas. He will be joining us from the UMaine Food Science Innovation Center where he serves as the coordinator. He is also the former White House chef under the Obama administration. Collectively, we have over 30 years delivering home food preservation workshops, and we're very excited to be able to launch these new educational webinars. These webinars are designed to provide you with the current USDA recommendations for preserving foods at home, and our weekly webinars feature foods in season corresponding with our main growing cycle. And our gardens are certainly becoming bountiful this time of year. However, today we will be focusing on another seasonal favorite, which is freezing Maine seafood. And we'll have a great demonstration on ways to use previously frozen seafood. The current USDA Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommend that twice a week you should make seafood, and that includes both, both fish and shellfish, the main protein source on your plate. Seafood contains a wide range of nutrients, including the healthy omega-3 fatty acids. According to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, eating about eight ounces per week, and that would be less for young children, of a variety of seafood and fish can help to prevent heart disease. And I just wanna do a little housekeeping and remind you that we have our webinar set up that you can hear and see us, but we cannot hear or see you. You are muted automatically upon entering the webinar. But rest assured that we do want to hear from you uh, with your questions through our Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please feel free to type your questions into the box and we'll be sure to get to those throughout the webinar or if we don't have time, we will get uh, the answer to you via email um, within the next few days. So thanks so much for joining us for today's topic and let's get started with a poll. And the question is, where do you plan to get the seafood that you'll freeze? And please feel free to uh, go ahead and make your selection from the following. I'm going to catch it myself. My friend or family catches it. I will buy it directly from a fisherman. I will buy it directly from the seafood market or at the, excuse me, seafood market, or I will buy it at the supermarket. And it looks like we have um, over 90% of our panelists, uh, excuse me, our attendees have responded. And it looks like the winner is that people will plan to buy it directly from a seafood market. So that's great news for our main local seafood um, industry. And we'll be providing additional information later on in our webinar on some other ways that you can access our local seafood. So I'm gonna pass it over to Lisa Fishman um, who will provide an overview of our main seafood. Lisa? Thank you, Kathy. There are several reasons why you might be wanting to freeze that extra seafood you have on hand. Perhaps you like to fish and had a good day on the water and now you're looking at freezing that fish for enjoying later in the year. Or maybe you went out deep sea fishing off our main coast and you were on a charter boat and got to go home with all of the fillets from your catch. Or perhaps you had leftover lobster meat from a lobster bake. Sometimes when you see a good sale from the fish truck on the side of the road, you buy a little bit extra. Maybe there's a great sale at the supermarket that you were able to take advantage of. I know this time of year I've certainly scored some excellent prices on my main seafood. One note about looking at the grocery store for your, for your fish that you're going to freeze, much of the seafood that's sold at the grocery store is previously frozen. Sometimes that will be marked as FAS, meaning frozen at sea, and then it's thawed to be sold fresh in the freezer case. If that's the situation, you don't want to freeze those particular fish fillets again, or you'll experience a loss of quality. 
or best result for fish that has not been frozen at sea or labeled with FAS on the label. And make sure that you can stock your uh, freezer with foods that are fresh. So there are different types of Maine seafood that freeze particularly well, both in the fish and the shellfish categories. Under the fatty fish selections, we have mackerel, trout, tuna, and salmon that are all coming out of Maine waters that are great selections for freezing. As far as lean fish, you want to look for flounder, haddock, cod, hake, halibut, redfish, bluefish, snapper, and most of the freshwater fish that you can catch in your lakes and streams around the state. I felt like I was reading a Dr. Seuss book there, Redfish, Bluefish. Um, as far as seafood, you want to be looking at um, some of those shellfish like scallops, oysters, crab, and lobster. All excellent choices for freezing. The Seasons for Seafood calendar from the Humane Sea Grant will be included as a resource for your reference. The Maine Family Fish Consumption Advisory Guidelines from the Maine Centers for Disease Control will help you to figure out the types of fish to consume to get the benefits of those really healthy omega-3 fats while reducing your risk for mercury intake. This resource will also be included in our follow-up email. We're going to watch a video now on how to crack open the Maine lobster. This is a quick video from the Maine Lobster Marketing Collaborative, and it demonstrates how to remove all of the tasty meat from both hard shell and soft shell lobsters. A hard shell lobster is one that has plenty of meat packed into those hard to crack shells, while a soft shell lobster is one that has most recently shed its shell, so it's much easier to crack open. And you'll find lots of extra water in those soft shells though. There's a big debate out there on which meat tastes better, meat from a hard shell lobster or meat from a soft shell lobster. I will let you make the decision. So that certainly is a great video that will whet your appetite for finding some of our great Maine lobster. And I know I'll be adding a rolling pin to my next um, equipment setup for our lobster feed. That was a, a new resource to me to see how easy it can be to get um, that meat out of the legs. So let's start to talk about the science of freezing a little bit. Quality is often an issue with home frozen foods. 
Ice crystals, off flavors, mealy textures, these are some of the pitfalls that can ruin your hard caught fish fillets, leftover lobster meat, or delectable Maine scallops. Seafood is in fact more susceptible to freezing issues like unwanted changes to color, texture, and flavor than other food items due to oxidation or the exposure to air. It also has a shorter shelf life than some other frozen foods like meats or vegetables because bacteria that's associated with seafood can grow at these lower temperatures. So plan to use your frozen cooked shell food within three months, your fatty fish varieties that were mentioned previously within two to three months, and lean fish varieties within six months. It's important to get a quick freeze when you're freezing seafood. This can be accomplished by keeping your fish as cool as possible after you catch it or buy it. What happens with a quick freeze is that the ice inside of the seafood will actually form smaller crystals and keep the cell walls more intact versus a long, slow freeze, which results in larger ice crystals that actually rupture the cell walls and ultimately affects the texture of the final product. So remember, it's a quick freeze that helps to end up with a higher quality frozen product. Proper packaging is also something we should talk about because proper packaging will help you to avoid freezer burn on your frozen seafood. Freezer burn is damage to frozen food that occurs when they are exposed um, to the dry freezer air. This exposure causes both dehydration and oxidation, which will again affect the color, texture, flavor, all overall quality of your frozen foods. Although the food is still safe to eat, the quality will be diminished. So remember to use moisture and vapor proof packaging materials meant for the freezer to avoid this unpleasant result. Another approach, glazing your fish fillets, is a technique that will help protect your fish fillets from oxidation and freezer burn. To glaze your fish, you simply dip the cold fish fillets into water or a lemon juice and gelatin mixture and this will help to protect the fish from oxidation and dehydration and will lend itself to a higher quality frozen fish product. So let's jump into the demo kitchen and find out what Kate has going on in the kitchen today as far as discussing the best types of packaging materials and also how to freeze seafood. Kate? Great, thanks Kathy. So I'm gonna cover um, the the recommended packaging for your frozen seafood, and then like she said, demonstrate how to freeze some lobster meat. So to start, you want to ensure that you're using a packaging material that's meant for the freezer. So this could either be plastic or glass. If you go the plastic route, um, you wanna make sure that it is a freezer grade plastic. So here I have a rigid sided container, um, and on the packaging it says specifically that it will hold up to the cold temperatures of the freezer. If you try and reuse like takeout containers or a yogurt container, that plastic is thinner and so therefore it can allow the freezer air to touch your food or it can crack and become brittle at, during those cold temperatures, which will again expose your food to air. So really the name of the game is about getting high quality materials to protect your food from the cold freezer environment. So this is a rigid sided container. If you were using this option, you would fill it about two thirds full, leave about a, an inch and a half headspace and then be covering it with some sort of liquid. So if you're doing lobster meat, you could do milk or cream. If you're doing scallops or mussels or oysters, shocked, you would put those in here and cover them with water. And then you could even go the extra length and um, cover the top with a little square of freezer paper or wax paper, or parchment even, to make sure that the ice crystals don't form on top of the surface of the container. So this is your rigid sided plastic option. If you wanna go glass, same idea where you're putting um, pieces of seafood in here and filling the container with liquid and leaving that headspace for expansion. This wide mouth pint jar is a great option. Um, it has straight sides so that it won't break in the freezing or thawing process. You want to avoid the more traditional uh, 
regular mouth pint jar because this neck of the jar could cause um, the jar to break as it freezes or thaws as the product expands. So avoid these, but rather use a wide mouth. You could use a smaller size, eight ounce or four ounce um, jelly jars. And then instead of the two part metal canning lid, you might opt to get this plastic storage cap, which fits on there nicely in one piece. Ball also has started making a leak proof option, which if you ever used the storage caps and had them leak iced coffee on you or something, you'll be happy to have the um, leak proof option instead. So those are the options for rigid sided containers. If you're going to use a soft sided plastic container, um, you want to make sure to get all of the air out of the container. So of course, kind of the Cadillac option is to invest in the vacuum sealer um, and use that appliance to remove all the air. This is the bags that come with it. They have the special um, proprietary bags. Or you can purchase a zip top bag that is meant for the freezer. So this is a um, freezer bag specifically. I have gotten tripped up before and just bought the storage bags. They, they're thicker than just the sandwich bag, but you really want to make sure you get one that's for the freezer. Um, and then there's also this freezer paper. So freezer paper might be a little bit harder to track down, although I did find it at the grocery store. Nice big sheets of paper that on one side have plastic, and that's the side that touches your seafood. So you'll lay this flat, put your fish fillet on it, um, wrap it up. We're gonna send you a resource that has little origami folding guides to wrap your fish fillets up nicely. And then on the dull side that isn't plastic lined, you can label and date your, your plastic or your seafood. And earlier I went ahead and did the um, lemon gelatin glaze for some haddock fillets Gulf of Maine caught. Um, and I was, so I was curious about what that process was like. It was super simple to make once we actually tracked down the unflavored gelatin. It's a little hard to find right now for some reason. But if you plan ahead, it was very easy to glaze your fish fillets. I just dipped them in this mixture and then froze them. So now they have this protective coating um, on the fillets themselves in the bag. So you can see how, how nice they look after being frozen. All right. So we're going to move into the demo for the lobster meat. So I have here um, some leftover lobster meat. And it's actually recommended to freeze your lo lobster meat in um, some liquid. So we're going to be using milk, but you could also use cream. I have a flexible bag that I've labeled and dated. And I'm just going to um, fill the bag full, well, two thirds full, let's say. I don't think I have that much lobster meat, but if you had tons on hand, fill it no more than about two thirds full into the bag. And then you're gonna to wanna to cover it with the liquid to protect it again. And as well as get all the air out of it, which I have a neat trick to show you. So this is all my lobster meat. I'm thinking of, I can make rolls later or chowder. Just gonna pour in a little bit of whole milk. You won't see this advice um, from the, the University of Georgia extensions freezing seafood guide, but we figured what do they know about freezing Maine lobster? So we're gonna go with the advice from the, the people who know how to care for seafood the best and add that milk or cream to freeze it. So then I'm gonna seal my bag most of the way full. And I did a pretty good job of getting all the liquid out, but I do wanna show you the, or all the air out, but I wanna show you this neat trick. I've got a big stock pot full of water, and this is gonna help me really get all the air out. So making sure your bag is mostly sealed, you're gonna just submerge this in there and the pressure of the water will force all the air out of the little bit of the bag that you don't have sealed. And then while it's underwater, seal it all the way off. Be careful because you don't want to make sure you get any water in there. And then voila, this looks like it has been vacuum sealed with this great little trick. And then you can see how it's kind of bunched up in the bottom of the bag. So this is where I like to take the chance to flatten it and then freeze it flat. This will allow for easier storage in your freezer, but it'll also make it so that the lobster will thaw a lot faster um, when it's time for you to use it. So this lobster meat is recommended to be used within three months because it's cooked shellfish. 
And I see that somebody was asking for us to review the storage guidelines again. So three months for cooked shellfish, fatty fish within two to three months, and lean fish within six months. And that's for best quality, just to make sure that you get the freshest main seafood experience you can out of your freezer. All right, so now we're gonna go to Lori and see if there's any other questions we can answer for you. We do, we have some awesome questions today. And the first one is, I've been told that lake trout, you should only eat no more, no more than once a month. Is that correct? Um, yes, that is in fact correct. And I would refer you to the resource that will be included in the uh, email follow-up. That is the CDC Consumer Advisory for um, Consuming Fish. And that does indeed specify that that lake trout does fall into the category of a sport fish and is not recommended for consumption more than one meal um, per month. But I encourage you all to check out that advisory because it does have specific information for specific population groups. For example, pregnant women and young children. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to combine um, three questions that we have. They all pertain to the milk. Um, why, number one, why use milk to freeze the lobster? Does it change the flavor of the seafood? And is there a substitute for the dairy when freezing lobster? Um, so the addition of the milk or cream simply adds to, simply increases the quality of the lobster meat um, once you go ahead and defrost it and choose to use it. Um, if you wanted to try and find a, a, a non-dairy alternative, you could certainly try to use um, a different type of perhaps a, a soy milk or something, um, but it is in fact um, the cream or the milk option that we know provides a higher quality product. So I hope I got all three of those questions answered there. I think you got them all, yes. <laughs> um, so our other question is, if you want the lobster meat for rolls, when it thaws, do you just drain it and rinse the lobster meat? Yeah, you can go ahead and just drain off, um, you know, the, the juices, um, including the dairy that was on there, again, the milk or cream, and that um, should give you a really high quality product. Okay, thank you very, very much. And that looks like all of our questions for right now. Um, so now I would like to turn it over to Rob for his cooking demonstration. Again, Rob is the UMaine Food Science Innovation Coordinator and former White House chef under the Obama administration. Thanks so much for the intro, Lori. I appreciate it. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Rob Dumas. I'm the Food Science Innovation Coordinator here at UMaine in Orono, and I manage the Dr. Matthew Highlands pilot plant for food processing. And, uh, we use that facility for research as well as, as a uh, realization of the land grant mission for UMaine and use it as a resource to assist businesses here in Maine with uh, creating food products, um, improving food products, and finding processing efficiencies. So uh, I'm excited to be here today. I hope you're excited to be here on this lovely Tuesday afternoon. So let's get started and let's cook some seafood. We'll see if I can do this in 15 minutes or if uh, Kathy Savoy is going to send me a, uh, a bad boy gram. So let's go ahead and get started with some lobster. So as we talked about, we're using previously frozen lobster. So in this package, I've got a lobster. So I have the tail, the claw knuckle, and the uh, I, I have it labeled with what it is. I have it dated. Okay, This was thawed under refrigeration. It's very important that when you take seafood out of your freezer, that you don't just leave it on the counter, but that you actually thaw it under refrigeration so that you don't have any time or temperature abuse. This lobster, I want to combine with some fresh main corn and a little bit of jalapeno that I've lightly charred in a, a dry skillet. And I've added a little bit of butter and a little bit of a uh, Mexican spice blend to that. So you could, if you had cumin, chili powder, and uh, maybe a little bit of coriander, you could place that in a bowl, equal proportions along with some salt. And that would make a great taco spice. Or you could buy something off the shelf 
um, like a old El Paso or something like that and use that as your taco spice. So very quickly, I just chopped up that lobster and I've combined it with the corn. Okay, I'm gonna set this aside. A blend of cheeses here. And what I've got is a blend of uh, cheddar, Monterey Jack, and Oaxaca cheese. And I've got a couple of flour tortillas. And I'm going to take these tortillas and I'll lay them flat in the cutting board, and I'm going to spread this cheese evenly over the tortillas, and then I'm going to top that with a little bit of this lobster and corn mixture. We're going to set these aside, and we're going to cook these a little bit later uh, in the demo. I want to get a couple of other things done first, so we'll set that aside right after I top it. Again, we're just going to stir that up. Really kind of a fun play. I was thinking, you know, this has got the butteriness of a lobster roll because we're going to griddle it in some butter. It's got the cheesiness of a lobster mac and cheese, and it's kind of fun. And the other thing I like about it is with lobster being, you know, I wouldn't say it's a, a inexpensive food product. It's great to be able to take this and stretch it out to feed uh, multiple people. And, you know, each person gets some lobster, but not necessarily an entire lobster. So an economical way to enjoy lobster with your family. So now that we've topped these nicely, we're gonna fold them over and give them a little bit of a press. Gonna fold it over and give it a little bit of a press. Now by pressing it a little bit, that's going to help us prevent having our topping fall out when we're cooking it. I'll set that up there. I've got a few that I've kept ahead of time and I'm just gonna set these right in with those. Now this could easily be something that you prepped ahead of time and then cooked when you were ready to cook. So um, a good, easy dinner option. All right. So the next thing that we're gonna move right into is we're gonna move right into doing our crispy fish tacos. So again, I've got, this time I'm using hake. And so I have a bag of hake here that I thought out in the refrigerator overnight. I've already went ahead and breaded some of this, but I've got three pieces left and I wanna demonstrate for you a very important uh, technique called three-stage breading. So you wanna start with flour, and this is flour that I've seasoned with that same kind of Mexican spice blend as before. And so I'm going to use one hand for the dry breading and one hand for the wet. So from the flour, it's going to go into an egg wash Okay, and an egg wash is one egg eaten with one cup of milk. And then I'm gonna switch fingers. So I'm gonna use, this as my wet finger. And I'm gonna dredge it into my final stage or my third stage, which is a seasoned cornmeal. And that's going to give the fish just a little bit more texture. And I think it goes quite nicely with the kind of uh, Mexican flavors that we're going to get to enjoy uh, with our taco garnishes. And by using one finger for wet, and one finger for dry, it helps you prevent from getting those, uh, those terrible kind of sticky batter fingers. I'm gonna wash my hands just really quick. Okay, so I've got a pot of oil. And I have this, uh, it's a neutral cooking oil, something like a canola, and I've got it heated up to 350 degrees. Uh, now the best way to check your oil temperature is to use a thermometer. Uh, now not all thermometers are rated for high heat cooking. So you wanna make sure that your thermometer has a range that is acceptable for frying. The other keys with frying is that you don't heat your oil too hot. If you get your oil too hot, you'll have it start smoking and you will degrade the quality of the oil and you'll end up with oil that makes your food taste kind of burnt. And another bit is to not um, underheat your oil because then you'll end up with soggy seafood. So having a thermometer and having some degree of confidence as to the temperature that you're cooking in is very important. And the last note on frying is uh, don't overcrowd your pan or your pot. Try to fry enough so that there is adequate oil to surround all of the product and get it all crispy without uh, having it become soggy. So 
I've got some fish here that I've already fried. Uh, it's, it's a great idea to have a, we call this in a restaurant, a landing zone for your fish to go into when it's done or any fried food. It's nice to use an absorbent paper towel that will wick away any excess grease that might be on that food product. Now, the fish fries pretty quickly. They're very thin slices. The oil's quite hot. And the serve safe recommended internal temperature for fish is only 145 degrees. So a lot of people will uh, overcook fish pretty significantly. It could be very dry or rubbery. Um, I would encourage you to, you know, cook it, check the temperature, and kind of find what works for you. For this level of thickness, for a you know, thin filet like that, I find about two minutes is plenty adequate to get to a place where you've got a fully cooked filet. So again, nice and golden brown. And we're gonna go right into our landing zone here. And I will go ahead and get started on the next part of the demo. So we are also going to demo using white fish, but this time, using cod, we're going to demo a blackened fish taco that has similar accoutrement but isn't maybe as rich and fatty as a fried fish taco. So again, I've got cod that was previously frozen, thawed in refrigeration, and I've got it laid out. It's important when cooking to have some degree of uniformity in, in your cuts. That will allow you to have a lot more even cooking. So this fish I've cut into about one ounce medallions because that's what fits well in the size taco that I have and I've got it laid on a foil lined baking pan. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna season this with a little bit of a blackening spice. So blackening spice is a spice that has a little bit of sugar added to it uh, and it's going to allow for a little bit of uh, caramelization to occur during cooking and you'll get a little bit of a, kind of a, a charred or almost grilled flavor. And then it's very important to add a little bit of fat to help things cook more evenly. Fat conducts heat really well and also adds some, some nice texture to food. So I season this with a little bit of uh, Bub and Mother's Downey's Dinner Dust, uh, Denna Dust, and it's, it's really good quality stuff. I like it a lot and it adds a fun flavor to this. So I'm gonna put this in my broiler. Yeah, I'm gonna broil that for about five minutes. Now, while that's broiling, we're gonna go ahead and cook our quesadilla. And our quesadilla, we're going to cook in a cast steel pan. Okay, I've already warmed this pan up, so you guys might get to see me burn my hand today, hopefully not. <laughs> so, we've got our quesadillas that we just warmed up. I've got a little bit of butter. We're gonna go ahead and put a nice pat of butter into our cast steel skillet here. Uh, my skillet's already hot, so it's moving around very quickly, getting uh, nice and bubbly and frothy. Uh, Increase our heat just a hair here. And we're going to go ahead and go in with our first quesadilla. Um, same thing as frying. Try not to overload your skillet, and you will definitely have better results. Okay. Set that in right there. Now, while those two are cooking, um, I'm going to go ahead and get out some of our accoutrement. on our plate as well. There. So I can see these are getting nice and bubbly and brown very quickly here. I give them a little bit of a, of a turn. Now because the lobster meat's already cooked, you're not necessarily looking for a, an internal temperature so much as you're looking for that cheese to get nice and melty and that outside crust to get nice and crisp. So those are cooking nicely. I'm going to peek in the oven at our broiling fish, which is broiling away beautifully. Go ahead and get out the rest of our accoutrement. So I had to get a little bit fancy today. And so I did a few different really fun ingredients to go on our tacos here. So I've got a corn tortilla and a flour tortilla. And I've got a really fun little plate with a little, little taco stand. Um, I'd like to crisp these up a little bit. That would be the best thing to do to put them in a little bit of a, in a, little bit of, uh, a dry skillet that's under heat or right on if you've got a gas stove. 
put it right onto your gas burner. It's a really nice way to put a, just a little bit of char onto those, uh, but not too much. Again, I'm just gonna flip these back over. That's looking really, really beautiful and golden brown. Perfect, I'm just gonna let those hang out in the hot skillet. I'm gonna turn it off while we work on garnishing up these tacos. So for both of our tacos, we're gonna start with a little base of shredded cabbage. A little bit of this one, and I've got some red and some green cabbage, completely optional. You could do just, uh, just one cabbage would be perfectly fine, but uh, it makes a nice little touch from a presentation standpoint. Now our corn tortilla we're going to do for our uh, blackened fish taco, and I'm gonna use a little bit of salsa verde in that, and that is a tomatillo and roasted chili um, salsa, so that one's ready to go. In our uh, crispy fish taco, we're gonna put down a little bit of chipotle lime crema, and we're gonna put a slice of avocado, just to kind of give you that nice buttery contrast to your fish. I'm gonna go ahead and put these onto my cutting board. Stop cooking. I'm going to check on my fish in the oven, which is going to be done. Perfectly charred. Just set that right there. All right, so let's finish this plate up. We're going to take a couple of pieces of this beautiful blackened fish. Actually, we're going to take just one. We're going to put that right there. We're going to take our bowl here that has our crispy fish in it. We're going to do a nice piece of crispy fish right there, that aside. And then we're going to take our quesadilla here. We're going to give it a little chop, set it right here on the side. And then I've got a little bit of shredded lettuce here. And on that shredded lettuce, I'll put a little bit of pico de gallo, a little bit of guacamole, And lastly, a little bit of sour cream. And then just to give it that final touch, a little sprinkle of cilantro. And then to finish off our tacos, it's really nice to have a pickled contrast. So we're gonna go on with a little bit of pickled red onion, and then a little bit of pickled radish. And that will do it for our tacos today. If you like it spicy, I would encourage you to try a little bit of uh, pickled chilies, which I like the pickled chilies on mine. I think it really makes it super delicious. But that's our cooking demo for today. That's our crispy fish taco and our blackened fish taco and our lobster quesadilla. So I hope you guys enjoyed that and I hope I stayed on time. Thank you. You sure did. Thanks so much, Rob. I wish I were near the uh, uh, Highland Pilot Plant to be able to get a taste of those great recipes. Um, but rest assured, we will be including those in our follow-up email today. So again, thanks, Rob. That was great. great. Let's uh, test your knowledge, folks, and see uh, with the poll and see if you were, uh, had your listening ears on and if you can answer the question, what's the proper way to thaw frozen seafood? Uh, this could be a multiple choice to respond to as many as you wish you think are correct. And we've got about 80% of our participants have responded. And indeed, uh, we'll share the results and see that, yes, you were able to respond correctly, um, that it can be um, thawed in the fridge overnight. Um, or you can do more of a fast-paced thawing method by uh, thawing it under cool running water. So thanks so much for participating in our poll. Um, and we've got one last tasty way for you to use your frozen seafood. And we've got a, a video from our FNEP colleagues on oven fried fish fillets. And we'll show that video.
thanks so much to our FNEP colleagues for featuring another way to use frozen fish. Let's join uh, Lori to see if we have any questions in the Q&A box. We do, we have one question, but I also want to acknowledge all the folks that appreciated that cooking demo and um, all the offers of Rob coming to their house to cook for them. So, <laughs> but um, our question is, in terms of the fish preserved in gelatin, do you typically do something to remove that gelatin upon thawing and cooking? If so, what do you do to eliminate it? So the thawing method for fish normally puts off a lot of water that is you know, released during the thawing process. And so that in and of itself um, will take care of removing the gelatin that is there. Um, recognize that gelatin is you know, a protein source and that is in fact what is helping to create a higher quality frozen food is the introduction of that um, protein to the product. Creates a greater barrier to prevent uh, freezer burn and quality loss. Um, so that was our only question. So we're going to forge on and talk about all of these great uh, recommended resources that you will be receiving in the follow-up email. Uh, we've got the main seafood guide. We've got packing methods for freezing foods that includes that um, directions for how to use the gelatin and lemon juice mixture for uh, fish fillets. You're gonna get that video if you wanna rerun the how to break down the main lobster using both hard shell and soft shell. And then again, the CDC uh, consumer advisory on fish, uh, which is called two meals a week for good health. Again, encouraging you to read that carefully because it does have specific information for um, some subgroups within our population as far as how often you should consume certain foods. Uh, the fish. Uh, home freezing of seafood, um, five steps to support our local seafood, which um, comes to us from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and um, some other information on um, freezing lobster. We want to um, acknowledge that due to COVID-19 and the lack of restaurant sales, our Maine fishermen have seen a dramatic decrease in their markets. And remember that you can shop directly with seafood producers by using this new directory from our UMaine agriculture colleagues. Uh, be sure to visit the seafood producers webpage or call first um, so you can learn about how their policies for sales may have changed during COVID-19. So back to Kate in the kitchen. We also have our new preserving coach that we've rolled out in conjunction with these webinars. So this is an opportunity for Maine residents to be paired with a trained master food preserver volunteer for preserving advice throughout the growing season. So your personal preserving coach can provide you advice by phone, email, or maybe even in person later in the year. We have a handful of people enrolled, but we still have plenty of interested master food preserver volunteers. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, you can email me. My email address is um, there on your slide. And tis the season for when folks may be getting a little overwhelmed with the produce that's coming out of their garden. So um, know that the Preserving Coach program is here for you. Um, upcoming webinars are listed on the slide and we will be back next Tuesday at two to discuss freezing fruit and also different ways to use it. Our other topics for August include preserving corn, tomatoes, and salsa. We will also have a webinar specific to teaching you how to use the atmospheric steam canner, which is a relatively new and research-based safe way to preserve your high acid foods. Um, after today's uh, webinar, we will get you an email with upcoming registration information, the great list of resources, and also the recipes from Rob's demo. Um, and we'll also include the information on how to get a hold of Kate if you're interested in being paired with a preserving coach. We also include a link to our evaluation, a certificate of completion, and if you wish to provide us with your U.S. mailing address, we're happy to put um, a free Headspace tool in the mail to you, which you do use when canning. 
and um, we, I see that there are a few questions in the Q&A box and we will uh, make sure to get uh, back to you via email to answer those questions. And we want to stick to our time frame and say thanks so much for joining us. We hope to see you next Tuesday at 2 and continuing on in the growing season. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.